A recent atmospheric carbon dioxide analysis from Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii shows that as of May 2019, levels had reached a new record of 414 parts per million, which hasn't been seen since the Pliocene epoch 3 million years ago. According to the Paris Climate Agreement, if we want to avoid a potentially catastrophic positive feedback loop of global warming, we need to stay below a 2 degree rise in global temperature, 2 Celsius above what it was pre-industrial revolution. A safer but much more optimistic goal would be to avoid a global temperature rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius. This was also put forth in the Paris Climate Agreement. Right now, we're at a rise of temperature around 1.08 degrees Celsius. At the rate we're going, we're estimated to reach that 1.5 degree mark by around 2035. Oh, but Jay, 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit doesn't seem that catastrophic to me. Well, uh, those are global averages. In some places, average temperatures have reached much higher than that already and uh, will continue to rise throughout the century. And yeah, the world isn't automatically going to end if we cross that 1.5 degrees Celsius mark, but there's a reason why at the Paris Climate Agreement they suggested a 1.5 degree rise instead of two, because at two degrees Celsius, things get so much worse. The percentage of people on Earth that would experience a severe heat wave once every five years would increase from 14 to 37 percent. That puts an extra 1.7 billion people at risk. On average, sea levels would rise another 10 centimeters or four inches, which is again an average. Other places would experience severe flooding. The chance of having a completely ice-free Arctic in the summer months would increase from three to 16 percent. The coral reefs that support marine environments around the world could decline as much as 99%. Hundreds of millions would become exposed to climate-related droughts, famines, poverty. The list of very not good possibilities goes on and on. And what's even more frustrating is we're inching closer and closer to this deadline every day, and some people in this country still don't even believe it's real. Our president called it a hoax. <laughs> the people who make all the decisions are making all the wrong decisions, and we're just like along for the ride while our entire species is like moving towards extinction. I mean, it wouldn't be that bad if our president uh, was like a closet climate change denier, but he is cutting funding to things that we need to fight climate change. Just as a short example, in 2018, he proposed they cut the DOE's efficiency and renewables funding by 70% or 1.4 billion, which includes a 74% cut to EERE's solar, wind, water, and geothermal programs. That's just a small example. His administration has made it abundantly clear to the public that they want to keep on supporting fossil fuels. The White House put out a statement justifying their massive budget cuts by saying that this negative emissions research is best done by the private sector, but that's kind of the point. You know, doing the dirty work, sequestering all this carbon dioxide, isn't going to be largely marketable. It's a responsibility and it's probably gonna need a lot of funding. And that's not socialism or me being a millennial, that's just facts. Anyway, we should be well past believing that climate change is real. We should be in the middle of implementing solutions and that is what this video is about. Looking at some actual promising looking solutions to help us decrease or maybe even one day reverse global warming. So quick primer on global warming, it's uh, it's real and it's happening because our cars and our coal plants, pretty much every form of combustion we use to do work, emits greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane. These gases reflect infrared light and prevent it from leaving the atmosphere. During this reflection, greenhouse gases heat up the atmosphere by transferring energy onto nearby air molecules. One of our main problems when talking about climate change and global warming is that there's too much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So what can we do about this? Idea number one, afforestation and reforestation. Trees, if you did not know, breathe in carbon dioxide and expel oxygen. Through photosynthesis, they take the carbon out of the surrounding air in the form of carbon dioxide and they basically layer it onto themselves to grow bigger. Not only are they great for storing carbon, forests are necessary for thriving ecosystems. Trees sound like the perfect tool for dealing with climate change and they are going to be a very necessary part but they do have a trade-off. Forests affect the Earth's albedo, or the amount of light it radiates back out into space. It might be intuitive or tempting to think that, you know, trees, they get rid of our main problem, which is carbon dioxide. So, you know, problem solved, solution found. But they actually create a new problem 
they absorb too much heat. There have been a bunch of studies on this and I'll leave some down in the description, but the gist is that reforestation or growing trees where they once were can be a very good thing, not only for our air, but for ecosystems all over the world. But afforestation or growing trees in new areas that were previously reflecting light and heat back into space doesn't really do any good. It could actually do more warming than cooling. Am I saying that we shouldn't plant any trees? No, we are still very behind on reforesting the areas that we've been cutting down in recent years. Apparently, since humans have been around, half of all trees on Earth have been cut down, which is not only detrimental to our air quality, but horrible for ecosystems for both land and sea animals. You may have heard of this collaboration on YouTube set up by Mr. Beast. It's called Team Trees. Uh, I think it is a perfect example of spreading awareness about how vital trees are while at the same time giving people that care a way to help. Let's move on to method number two on our list, which is carbon capture and sequestration. This method would be used at big pollution sites like factories and power plants. There are two main types, pre-combustion and post-combustion, but they're both designed to drastically reduce the amount of carbon dioxide emitted by these plants. So pre-combustion, as you may have guessed, is designed to take the CO2 out of fuel before it's burned. The hydrocarbon fuel is reacted with oxygen to make synthesis gas, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen gases. The hydrogen is then separated and used as a fuel source. Water is added to the carbon monoxide to make carbon dioxide, which is subsequently stored, and additional hydrogen, which is added to the new fuel hydrogen. Post-combustion carbon capture is designed to take the CO2 out of the power plant's output after the fuel has been burned. What they do is they pass the exhaust gases through an absorber column, which is filled with a solvent like ammonia. The CO2 mixture is then blasted with superheated steam and the CO2 is then released and stored. In my opinion, this post-combustion method is the most useful and versatile because you can retrofit old power plants with this technology, whereas in pre-combustion you would have to start with a new power plant that would have to use a fuel source that neatly separates into useful and not useful gases. Once either one of those methods produce enough CO2, it's transported via some kind of vehicle to a site where it's pumped deep underground and hopefully not reused, but I'll get back to that later. Both of these methods, even though they're good ideas, unfortunately are still carbon neutral, which means that they don't reduce the overall amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I'd argue that they're even carbon positive because if they both max out at 90% efficiency, there's still that 10% of carbon dioxide leaking out into the environment. That's just how math works. Hey guys, I'm editing. Um, I realized there's a point I forgot to make. There's a, another kind of carbon capture and storage method. It's called BECCS, uh, Bioenergy Carbon Capture and Storage. And this is thought to be carbon negative because you take uh, trees that are above ground, you gather that up, break it down into fuel, and then you use whatever carbon capture method you were going to use before, and you bury that compressed carbon deep underground, and it gets rid of the carbon that was in the atmosphere. But this method is kind of unethical and unsafe because you would have to cut down a ton of trees for this to work. Okay, back to the video. Which brings me to method number three, direct air capture. It's just a way of sucking the carbon dioxide directly out of the air. It's a very sought after method for researchers because potentially it could be very carbon negative. And its cost in recent years has gone from 600 per ton of carbon dioxide captured to in most cases under 100. Most EAC systems are designed to have fans that pull in large amounts of air, which flows over some kind of adsorbent material that holds on to the carbon dioxide. Then in a separate process, that material is manipulated to pull the CO2 out of it. That company can then do whatever it wants with the separated compressed CO2. They can bury it deep underground, or more realistically, they can sell it to another company for a profit to help cover costs. There are three main companies out there that are making huge strides in direct air capture technology. One of the companies, Climeworks, opened up a commercial operational plant in Zurich, Switzerland as a kind of three-year test to gather economic and environmental data for bigger projects. It's estimated that it captures 900 tons of CO2 annually, which is about the same level released from 200 cars annually, and they sell a concentrated CO2 for a profit. They've also been working on a plant strategically located next to a geothermal power plant in Iceland, where it can take in atmospheric CO2 and then send that CO2 700 meters underground where it goes to be mineralized. The company has a very admirable and optimistic goal of removing 1% of the world's atmospheric CO2 by 2025. For this last method, I'm going to be briefly talking about chemical weathering. 
Usually in nature, rain, which is usually slightly acidic, having absorbed atmospheric CO2, reacts with rocks, very slowly breaking them down into smaller rock grains, which forms bicarbonate in the process. This bicarbonate eventually finds its way to the ocean where it stays stored for hundreds of thousands of years, either on the sea floor or dissolved in the water. This last method is a way to replicate that process, but have it happen on a much shorter time scale. It's known as enhanced weathering, and it might seem like a great idea, but I'm going to put an asterisk after it because it's very under-tested and very hotly debated as being unsafe, but I'm going to briefly talk about it anyway. The general consensus when talking about enhanced weathering and methodology is to use some kind of silicate rock with certain types of cations, more specifically silicates in the olivine family, rich in magnesium and iron, like basalt, dunite, or peridotite. The idea is to break down these rocks to expose more surface area and either sprinkle them on crops or next to oceans so they can react quickly and wash out to sea. Right now, farms use crushed rocks like limestone to negate soil acidification, and the thinking is that if they were replaced with silicate rocks, they can capture and sequester CO2 while at the same time dealing with soil acidification with bicarbonate. Farmland would also be a good choice because it covers some 12 million square kilometers, or like 11% of the global land area. Now, normally, natural rock weathering annually absorbs around 0.3% of global fossil fuel emissions. In a paper published in environmental research letters, the potential carbon removal could be as much as 95 gigatons for dunite and 4.9 gigatons for basalt. It could also supply silicon and other nutrients to terrestrial ecosystems and increase the pH of ocean waters counteracting the CO2 induced acidification. But this idea again is still in its infancy in terms of testing and research. My guess is that it's not going to be one of these methods to get us to where we need to be. It's probably going to take all of these methods at once. And as the prices drop for each one of these methods and the urgent to start implementing these solutions increases, we'll start seeing some actual changes. I think as the market for this green technology keeps evolving, or uses open up on the market for this captured carbon, hopefully not bad uses, hopefully we're not just putting the carbon pack into the air, but uh, I think there will be more of an incentive or more competition to invest in this kind of technology. But anyway, that is all I have for this video. If you made it this far, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you next time.